so hello everyone uh, good morning dear authors and invited guest welcome to technical session 4d i on behalf of global knowledge research foundation and gr scholar scholarist it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the ninth international conference on information and communication technology for sustainable development icd 4sd 2024 goa india the ninth edition of the conference is being organized in hybrid mode the physical event was organized today in goa and the virtual event is being held through zoom meeting and tomorrow for 8th and 9th august i hope you will enjoy the knowledgeable and interactive session through the day in this session in total we will have 10 presentations each presenter will be given a time span of 8 minutes for the presentations and 2 minutes will be given for q and a uh i have a gentle request to all of the participants and presenters to please wrap up your presentation because we have a time constraint of 8 minutes and also there is another request to all the participants that you all stay connected till the closing remarks if you have any query or update then you can write to write it to me in the chat box i am your host for today just before we start the session i would like to introduce you all to the chair of this session Dr Abhijit Chitre Dr Abhijit Chitre is presently working as associate professor at Vishwakarma Institute of Information Technology he has overall 21 years of teaching experience one year of industry experience and 33 research publications and seven patents his specializations are signal processing machine learning and vlsi oh uh, thank you sir for joining us today yeah thank you so much for inviting yeah uh, now i would like to start with the papers so the very first presenter we have today is rudra mondal i would uh, like you to start with your presentation good morning am i audible uh, yes you are audible rudra okay. yeah i'll just start sharing my screen yep i'll stop sharing my screen now you will be able to share your screen you may start with your presentation and uh, after 8 minutes uh, there will be q and a my screen is visible right yeah visible okay. yes okay so good morning everyone i am rudra mondal from the vishwakarma institute of technology pune and today i will be presenting on the automated billing card system using computer vision and web integration so the current retail landscape that we have inv involves us as customers to go to the supermarkets shop for items and then we have to wait in line in the queue while each and every one of our uh, objects is scanned one by one by the uh, work employees present there so this can lead us leads to long waiting times and is also slows down the user experience and makes leads to customer dissatisfaction in case of um, weekends and days when there are um, heavy traffic so uh, we proposed a smart shopping cart which will streamline this um, uh, shopping experience and thus improve the customer experience so what are our objectives with this project first is to um, make a uh, object detection easier using a computer vision algorithm also to um, allow for real time processing of the data and make uh, uh, and implement a user interface which is interactive hmm. also we want to automate the billing process and make it so that the invoice is generated on the go as the customer shops through the supermarket and thus uh, speed up the bill generation process and thus the customer experience so what are the major tools used here so mainly um, the, the first stage involves object detection so here we are using computer implementing computer vision using the open cv library then for hardware we are using the arduino uno microcontroller which is based on the atmega 328p microcontroller for the object um, detection system we are also using the yolo v3 uh, system which is the you only look once for actually detecting the objects and for um, identifying each of the items in the uh, uh, cart we are using uh, the convolutional neural network called as darknet 53 which is a neural network of 53 layers so how does this work um as soon as we place an object into the cart we have a camera module integrated into the cart which will uh, pick up on the object and then it will use uh, compare it with the image dataset already available 
moment it finds a match, it will take the object's name and its price, compare it with the item database for the supermarket. And then it will use the automated billing system, add the object's um, details in the automated billing system. Up, uh, on the meanwhile, it will also update the uh, supermarket's inventory to show that the um, object has been picked up by the user. And thus it will um, create a bill on the spot as the um, user is shopping through the super supermarket. So the methodology is, uh, first we are taking the input in the form of the objects, then we are integrating it with the computer vision, uh, which OpenCV library, which I mentioned earlier for object detection. Then this uh, comparison with the um, data set happens using the CNN uh, convolutional neural network, which is the, the darknet 53. The item re recognition also happens to this. Then we are doing the communication and integration using the uh, Flask framework. And also we're communicating with the database for uh, the various objects and update the uh, each of the objects present in the cart so we are also uh, uh, provided a in the pro, on the prototype we have also provide, given provisions to um, for case of you know error detection in case suppose the wrong object has been detected and we have a system which we'll uh, demonstrate soon and this will also uh, we have also the on the go bill generation to uh, further streamline the automation the billing process so now we'll move on to the live demonstration. I will actually um, show how it works. Okay, so as you can see, um, it's already started detecting of the objects. So first I, I'll show you a few of the objects you can detect. So here the objects have been detected and you can see the few uh, things have been, and you can see the temporary state of the bill right now. So here a few of the uh, objects have been detected and So a few, a few of the objects have been detected, as you can see, however, there are a few errors also in the list. So in order to just uh, switch out these errors, we can just write the number of the um, item in the list to remove it from the uh, bill currently. So here, uh, the bird is also an error. So out here, it will be the second one. So I just need to press two and the bill will be uh, finalized. So once I press done, this will give us the final bill. And we can also see it in the uh, we can also see it in the text file out here. So now we are going to use web integration. So here I've used the Flask framework to basically display all the contents of the web uh, bill on a web page. So here you can see the values of each of the items along with their price. Also, the total is calculated out here. Now the hardware part will be um I will also show the way for the hardware part because it's um, taking up uh, like I'm, uh, I have to use the webcam for the meet. So I, I'll just show the how, uh, how the hardware part is working. Okay. So 
So here you can see that it will show at every moment is showing the last scanned object along with the total price of the bill and also the name of the last scanned object. And it keeps updating periodically. Hmm. Now out here, suppose as in, in case of an error, we can press that green button up there, which is already being pressed. And after about five seconds, it will update the bill and it will show out here that the price has been deducted from the total bill. Hmm. And also that it has been Next to the name, you can see hmm, there is an R out here, which basically indicates that this item has been reducted from the current bill price. So in conclusion, we can say that hmm, this uh, automated billing part has, can be basically speed up the streaming process by also um, reducing the wait times and making it more convenient for users. Using the um, LCD display and control also enhances the user experience. As we can see, oh, all the um, steps that are occurring in the current bill generation process as we um, shop. So I, this project can be implemented to streamline the uh, uh, billing process. And also in, in the future, it can be integrated with um, online web payments and UK technology to further um, improve the current retail landscape. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, uh, if there are any questions. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, when you practically implement the system on the card, uh, how are you going to download this code and what will be the hardware which will be actually placed are you going to use laptop that time how the system uh, no, sir, no sir yeah. uh, there's actually um, a camera module called the esp32 cam module yeah so yeah. that can be used for uh, getting the uh, you know as the actual camera plus yes. it also has a wi-fi system like okay. it has wi-fi capabilities so we can use that along with the node mcu module to you know okay. which also has wi-fi capabilities for the com communication between the database and the items. So your, your YOLO, YOLO and everything will sit on that uh, same card? In so the, uh, the actual, uh, the image data set, we can keep it on a cloud, which will be maintained by the supermarket itself. Okay. The, hmm, and the camera module will be used for the actual image detect, uh, image, you know, getting the image feed of the various objects. Okay. And the node MCU uh, microcontroller will be using for the uh, communication and storing the data for the bill okay any specific reason for using v yolo v3 when you have other versions also right up to v7 yes, or actually now yolo v8 is available but yeah. we have been working on this project since last year so okay. last year yolo v3 was the most uh, uh you know advanced version back then and plus also it has the you know uh, it has like up to 80 objects it can identify and yeah. it's like the processing speed is really fast. So I know YOLO v3, uh, YOLO v8 and all, you also have the ability for, you know, custom data sets and everything. But this project we've been working from last year and this is how everything was integrated. So we, okay. we, uh, we, that part is actually in development for future purposes. Okay, okay, good. Okay. Yes. Very nice attempt, good. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, sir. Now we will start with the next presentation. Uh, so now next we have your uh, Miss Vishruta. Uh, if you are present with us, you may start with your presentation. And she is presenting on the paper title "Bridging the Gap: Improving Students' Academic Performance Through Attentive Listening and Effective Time Management." Hi, good morning. Good morning, ma'am. I've stopped sharing my screen. Uh, you can start with your presentation now. Yeah. Yeah, is it visible now? Yes. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. My name is Vishwata. Uh, I'm 
currently pursuing MCA in Amrita Vishwavidya Peter Mysore. Our topic is uh, bridging the gap, uh, one second, yeah. improving students' academic performance through <clears throat> attentive listening and effective time management. Our agenda is to uh, take you through the significant factors and uh, uh, methodology used for the data collection in our hypothetical testing and uh, the conclusion of the same. <coughs> Active listening or effective listening is a comparatively effective communicating communication strategy to improve students' learning. So in today's world, uh, we are in, uh, currently uh, students pursuing higher education. Uh, as we are in working under the learning and analytics domain, we uh, found many students who, whose academic performance is degrading because of their inattentive listening in the classroom. So students who have the mental room to listen and to uh, intently grasp things or concepts that have been explained in the presentations or seminar only will have uh, later uh, will be using less time to comprehend the same. So basically uh, time and uh, time management and active listening will be uh, interconnected uh, for a person to uh, achieve academic uh, success. So fostering the success in the field of education requires uh, many uh, tied up relationships. For example, uh, uh, students and individuals, 50% uh, or to 60% of their time will be in the classroom uh, area. So if you are not able to, if an individual is not able to concentrate in the class because of his wandering thoughts or uh, maybe physical distractions like some captivating images in the classroom, or any other uh, physical distractions like noise uh, or one's own wandering thoughts. Uh, these things can be affecting the listening capability of a student. And uh, additional work, people or individuals who uh, go to part-time jobs in, with, uh, along with their uh, uh, pursue of their education might find it difficult uh, to manage the time. This procrastination comes into picture in, in such uh, situations. So uh, it is required to manage all these three together uh, in order to uh, have more or a better academic performance. So the significant factors uh, which affect uh, a student's uh, learning ability uh, uh, as 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 far as the active listening is concerned, uh, it also depends on how many hours you study weekly. So if your weekly study hours is, for example, less than 10 hours, then you are not dedicating much time to uh, what uh, higher education you are pursuing into. So basically, we conducted a survey on a group of people through online questionnaires and interviews in which uh, we targeted a group of uh, people under the age group of 18 to 26. So people who are pursuing a degree and uh, a higher education for that uh, sort. And for that uh, pursuing, if the academic performance has to be well, then these factors have to be taken into consideration. So exam preparation, uh, how, how earlier they will start their uh, exam preparation. For example, you cannot be uh, procrastinating it until the last moment, and then uh, your scores is uh, likely to be uh, fallen down. Uh, in order to avoid uh, physical distractions or mental distractions in the classroom, note taking will be effective because you will be highlighting and uh, writing it in your own method. So also uh, listening should be uh, uh, intended. You, you should, uh, uh, channelize your thoughts in a way that you will listen to what the speaker is saying. Discussion among the peers is an important aspect because uh, your uh, thoughts will have a uh, uh, motivation when other people tend to support it or they give other uh, their valuable insights on it. So attendance to classes also is a major uh, uh, factor in this uh, sort. Additional work, as I said, you have to prioritize the timings allotted to college and to work uh, accordingly. These are the factors which affect the grade. <clears throat> this is our research methodology. 
So through online survey among uh, uh, around 300 to 400 uh, college going students, data was collected and was pre-processed uh, to handle the missing values. After uh, feature selection and uh, considering the uh, factors which affect the academic grade, uh, hypothesis uh, testing was started and based on the correlation analysis, uh, statistical models were developed. And by this, it was concluded. Uh, so as I said, we had a 30 item uh, data set, uh, which includes the responses from uh, various uh, time students. The participants group, age group was exactly selected to be between 18 to 26, because in the majority of the Indian colleges, the peak period of pressure is considered to be this as uh, people are expected to have a schedule of their own and they tend to not do it. Um, so data was uh, pre-processed and missing values were handled uh, in this uh, section. So hypothesis one says uh, time management skills positively correlate with academic performance. For this hypothesis to be uh, proven, uh, four variables were considered among the 30 item data set. It was the weekly study hours and um, uh, if we are dividing the exams to be two in a semester, then uh, how many, when do you start preparations and how many hours do you dedicate for it? And as I said, note taking. Spearman correlation analysis uh, was used uh, to find the correlation between the time management skills and academic performance. The statistics as, is as uh, below. So based on this uh, statistics, uh, the null hypothesis was rejected. And so it, it shows that uh, good is necessary for the academic performance to be uh, better. So hypothesis two says active listening in classes is positively correlated with academic performance. So listening in class, discussion in the classroom, and class attendance are the three variables which are chosen for this hypothesis to be uh, proven. And our results, analysis of a variance, this result, which finds the difference between uh, two means, uh, this was uh, uh, taken into consideration. So here, the p-value and f-statistic values were uh, calculated, and based on the outcomes, we can say that uh, uh, active listening indicators are definitely uh, correlating with academic performance. So higher the listening skills, higher the performance will be. So hypothesis three says the impact of additional work on students has a negative correlation. The more work a person uh, has uh, with regards to their time schedule, the less their uh, dedication towards the academic uh, uh, performance will be. So additional work and academic performance are the two variables uh, considered in this aspect. For this uh, hypothesis three, Pearson correlation analysis uh, was used to find the coefficient. Here a linear uh, uh, variable is uh, considered by calculating between the two variables. And also we use the random forest uh, classifier to find the uh, accuracy of how well this is going to affect your uh, uh, academic performance. So as that uh, case is 66.67% uh, and the F1 score, uh, which is a harmonic mean of uh, precision and recall is 0 0.61. So in conclusion, uh, by considering all the features of a student, for example, like the demographic information, their uh, dedication towards education and how well they manage their time, how can they actively concentrate in the classroom. Based on all this, we find that there has to be an equilibrium between uh, how well they manage their time, how they listen and how they spend their time. So this can be utilized by the education policy makers and others to improve their uh, uh, strategies to make a, an individual concentrate in a classroom and to uh, give a better results uh, based on the performance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your presentation.
are there any questions or shall we start with the next one so the next presenter we have here today is amruta anu uh, and their uh, the paper title she is presenting on is empowering crisis resilience and immersive journey to survival mastery ma'am uh, i request you to start with your presentation yeah um could you just let me know when you are able to see my screen yeah it's visible now all right um so um i'm amrita anup and i'm doing this paper with tarun kumar um my paper is about uh, empowering crisis resilience uh, basically talking about how people react during uh, a high risk situation so i'd actually I, I like to ask you guys to just think about something what was your first reaction when you came across the fact that there was a major pandemic that was coming up outside the world in 2020 most people what they came up with is a fear and second was denial that they would never face something as life changing as this uh, most people generally react with this way where they are uh, unsure of how to react they are so scared that they would rather think about how it would never happen to themselves and hence that is why i have picked this topic so around 78% 78% people react with fear and denial where, which actually hinders people from actually reacting in a proper way uh, when they are in a high risk situation like a pandemic or a flood it could be a lion slide so on and so forth and we are seeing a lot of that in the uh, world right now so i picked up this topic in hopes of being able to deal with this in my own way um the objectives are to gauge the level of preparedness in people in our um, society to understand the reason for the lack of preparedness both physical and mental to come up with a design uh, to come up with an immersive and a captivating experience so that people are able to deal with it and uh, create a personalized experience for them and create a design intervention which will be deal with all of these problems so i did a intensive research and spoke to almost 35 people who have uh, both been in a high risk situation like a flood um earthquake and um a uh, house fire these were the three criteria that i could look into in the time that i had and people who have not experienced any of these high risk situations and just to understand how was the different uh, preparedness levels in these people and i came up with a mirror of reasons of why people are not able to react the way they should be reacting um in these situations and created a giga map to understand the core problem of the uh, of this problem and the, as mentioned fear and denial is just one of the problems that people face uh, the few other things that they face are as mentioned information overload in, uh, lack of information that actually needs to be there for the people that are there in a high risk situation in high uh, possibility that they would the experience such said uh, experience the outdated material where it's not interactive and people are unable to understand how they should actually uh, face with these situations even if they are in a situation and have the knowledge that they need um and a few others are a digital divide where there is information out there but they people don't have the technology or the uh, knowledge to access these information so there is a major uh, gap in the industry and not just to monetize it but also it is a matter of life and death people we can uh, introduce these kind of knowledge into the world into in a way that people are e e uh, eager to conceive it and uh, this will not just increase life expectancy and survival rates but it also creates a sense of society and people are able to um, de delve into these problems and uh, grow stronger as a society so i came across multiple ideation processes i mapped out each person that i came across in the interviews created a journey map of how people dealt with it when they had the knowledge when they did not have the lot knowledge and and were just overcome by uh, fear and denial and understood how where we can intervene to introduce something that can help them understand how they need to deal with these created personas and empathy mapping to just understand their basic uh, level of uh, experience 
Uh, this led to creating a list of requirements and these requirements kind of gave an outline of what the intervention, the, the design intervention that I come up with should have at the end of the day. Uh, these kind of created an outline and help understand how we can go ahead, created a morphological matrix after that to create uh, a, a guideline of how many uh, concepts we can have and what are the ideas that can be clubbed into that we've uh, that I came across in my uh, brainstorming uh, session where we kind of shot out all of the possible solutions that we could have. Um, it could be in an educational approach, gamified approach. It could be just community community engagement, so on and so forth. And these were all put together into different concepts that could help gauge and understand if people were actually able to deal with these problems with the said concept. So the framework that I followed was uh, first understanding the problem. So the lack of awareness and knowledge was one of the major problems, as I mentioned, fear and denial. And then one more thing that really stood out was inaction. People just kept procrastinating and realized that people are not ready to deal with a problem because they would rather be in denial than um, take action. So to create the solution, we came up with an exposure therapy of uh, a safe uh, VR environment. So the main reason people have the lack of uh, awareness is because they are unable to put themselves out there and actually experience something like that and would rather stay in their safe space. And so creating a safe virtual environment where they know that nothing wrong can go happen um, kind of helped understand the user better and create an experience that would uh, be advantageous to them. An action planning, creating interactive scenarios for different uh, situations that they can be in, help to understand the problem and give them solutions as well as consequences of what would happen if they took the wrong steps and knowledge or acquisition through VR and uh, simulations. So the strategy that I went ahead with was the course cycle of experiential learning, where there's a concrete experience as you can see, um, where they are coming across this VR experience in their own safe space, but are put through um, simulations that feel very realistic and they understand how they need to react in such a situation if they are, God forbid, God forbid to be put in that situation, creating reflective uh, observations based on these experiences, speaking to them at every step of the way, understanding why something worked and something didn't. And then abstract uh, conceptualization included taking these observations and kind of uh, making sure these experiences are either um, added or deducted to ad uh, be advantageous to the user. And then continuing the active experimentation with different uh, users to understand each person's uh, pros and cons, each uh, feature's pros and cons to understand if the experience is actually cohesive. So these con con uh, this led to a, a uh, like generation of various concepts, but after the uh, experimentation, we realized that just the VR experience and an outreach program would be enough to help people uh, deal with these situations. So we came up with a mock-up of how it would look uh, in a kind of gamified way to uh, exp uh, experiment with the user. And most people were actually quite happy with just a mock-up, with just a kind of 2D um, rendition of the intervention. Um, and we also got a lot of uh, positive response from the younger generations because this is a little more less intense and uh, more interactive, more fun for them. Uh, and at the same time, teaching them how they could experience it, how they would um, deal with such a situation rather than um, kind of giving them the gory details. And this gave us a lot of insights about how the final VR experience would look like. And that's how we created the VR experience. So this gave us a detailed insight and we put the users in a earthquake uh, zone where they were given a decision. So what would you do next? So would you like to stay or would you like to run? And these kind of gave them a detailed insight as to what they should be doing. And in case, even if they pick the wrong decision, they are uh, given with the consequences and, key, and this, first-hand experience gives them an understanding of what they should be doing and what they should be doing. And 
I showed the product, the uh, presentation if there is time. But yeah, that would be me. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now, if there are any questions. How, what, what was your sample size for the first uh, interview part? Analyzing uh, the mindset? So I um, first did an interview with 20 people um, and then sent out a survey which was answered by around 550 people. And this gave me the initial draft um, problems. Okay. And then uh, you have, uh, in the conclusion, are these the same 20 people who have already given the interview and then any any uh, training was given to no no training the mindset Everyone later was, on sorry uh, could you repeat that any training or anything is given to mm -hmm. verify the change in the mindset later on because the whole aim is to right. make people aware and keep them in a proper position of thinking when it comes to some calamity right so right. anything right. which you are proposing uh, on those lines yeah, so what happened was um, I did, so I did initially 20 people and these same 20 people were asked to experience the VR experience as well. Additionally, 15 people were included to ensure that there is no point that was overlooked in the initial testing. This helped me understand if um, I was actually catering to a larger number of people, not just the people that I interviewed and uh, which kind of uh, did prove and these 15 people who did additionally did come up with the same problems that had uh, that I collected in the first 20 people and uh, that helped me really uh, kind of tweak the whole thing to adjust to the whole uh, problem okay. I hope I've answered your question yeah All right. thank you uh, thank you ma'am uh, now we will start with the next presenter Uh, so the next presenter we have here today is uh, Thulasu Bikku, ma'am. So the paper title she's presenting is Enhancing Named Entity Recognition, NER, in Biomedical Text, BioBert on COD-19 Dataset. Ma'am, if you're here with us today, uh, you, you may start with your presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me, ma'am? Can you hear yes. me? Now you'll be able to present. Okay. Okay. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Tinsi Bikku, working as an associate professor in Amrita University. And uh, today I'm going to present about enhancing named entity recognition and we are in biomedical text, BioBert on a COD-19 data set. And coming to the contents of the data. Okay, coming to the contents, today I'm going to discuss about abstract introduction, hardware and software tools, existing system, proposed model, hardware and software requirements, sequence of biobot, experimental results and references. Okay, um, before starting the abstract, I want to give a brief introduction about what is biobot. Here we are having multiple documents, which are medical documents, for this, the requirement of bio, bio bird is much required. Here, bio bird means biodirectional encoder representation from transformers for biomedical text mining, which is a variant of BERT. As we know that BERT is used to identify the named entities. And bio bird is which is used to identify the medical terminology. This is the use of using bio bird. And uh, uh, BERT means bio biodirectional encoder representations from transformers model. Specifically, free time on large scale biomedical literature. BioBot is designed to improve the performance of NLP tasks like named entity recognition, relation extraction, and question and answering in the biomedical domain. And coming to the abstract, named entity recognition is a crucial task in the natural language processing, particularly in the biomedical domain. Here, we can easily identify the biomedical entities like the gene names, diseases, chemicals in the COVID-19 research articles. Here we are having some of the articles, whether the article is relevant to our topic or not. So by using this biomedic bio bird, we can easily identify the chemical names which we are using in the research articles, our genes, our diseases. Based on this, we can easily segregate the abstracts which are relevant to our research. 
the workflow begins with the data processing, including the here we are able to handle the missing values, dropping low frequency tags, and the tokenizing the text using the BioBird, to BioBird tokenizer. Here, in the context of BioBird, the NER involves identifying and classifying the uh, key biomedical entities like uh, genes, protein names, and uh, diseases and drugs within the text. Here, we are able to do the pre-processing. In the pre-processing, we are able to do the tokenization and handling the specific uh, biomedical terminology. And uh, for this model, we are giving the input as a pre-processed text is given to the BioBirth model, and which is already pre-trained on the medical uh, biomedical literature and uh, fine-tuned for the NER task so that it will be easy for us to uh, recognize which uh, research articles are relevant to the particular uh, terminology like uh, based on the gene or protein or diseases and uh, chemicals. And uh, we are able to predict uh, BioBot output predictions for each token in the text, indicating whether it belongs to a specific entity category or not. Now, uh, even for the bioplastics, are, uh, everywhere we are using the this BioBot um, are uh, based on the particular uh, a domain we are able to uh, introduce, we are able to develop a BERT so that it will be easy for us to identify the research article based on the, for the it will be very helpful for the researchers also. But in the post uh, processing, the output is post processed to, the, uh, to reconstruct the named entities from the token level of predictions. And the BioBot has shown to outperform the models on various biomedical NLP tasks due to the pre training on the domain specific data. Here, the results demonstrate the prom promising performance of the BioBot NER model on the COD-19 data set. Uh, anyways, we can see in the uh, experimental results part. And uh, coming to the NER, as I told you that the named entity recognition is a natural language processing method, which is a subcategory of uh, AI and ML. Here, NER means named entity recognition. If you give the document based on this uh, uh, tokenization for the each token we can easily identify which named entity it is so named entity recognition is to automatically extract the structured information from the unstructured data and it enables the machine to understand and categorize the entities so based on this we can easily identify the relevant the particular abstracts of the particular domain so that the researchers easily can uh, do the research in a particular area so this will be very helpful for the in the medical domain this bio biomedical terms which is very uh, useful in the bioinformatics or medical fields. And here you can see the example, BioBird based named entity recognition demo. The expression NT3 in the supporting cells in embryos preserve the BRN3C null mutants. Here it can easily, BioBird can easily identify what it is. NT3 is the gene name and the supporting cells are the cells and the organisms, mutants are the organisms. This is how Whenever you give any document to the model, then it can easily identify whether it is a protein, whether it is a chemical name, whether it is as a, in the BERT, you can easily identify based on the uh, co-occurrence or uh, correlation among the uh, among the tokens. We can easily identify whether the apple is an organization or apple is an uh, fruit. So here also based on this uh, correlation among the uh, uh, tokens, we can easily identify whether it is gene name, cell name, organisms, or whether it is a protein name. Here we are using the deep learning model, or and uh, some machine learning techniques are applied, and uh, by giving some rule-based rule systems, we are easily uh, able to construct the machine. In the BioBird, is a biomedical language representation model designed by the biomedical text mining tasks. So coming to the existing system, here we are having manual feature engineering and domain-specific rules and dictionaries. And uh, by using this deep learning techniques, we are able to construct based on the machines only. So that if we tell that whether it is uh, um, based on the neural networks, we can easily identify whether it is recognized as strong. If we give it as a, uh, 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 as a input feedback to the system, it can automatically correct itself and it can uh, construct its own rules, its own rules. The limitations to the system are lack of scalability, robustness, existing system. Now, whatever the system we have constructed, it is... Uh, uh, it is overcoming the limitations of the existing system. And the proposed model is, uh, we are giving input as coordinating database and uh, pre-processing. In the pre-processing, we are able to do the tokenization, normalization, and formatting of the data. And we are giving it to the BioBot, which is a pre-trained model. After this, we are able, easily able to identify the gene, protein names, and diseases. Extracted entities uh, within the context so that we can easily segregate the uh, context based on the uh, abstracts or research articles based on the uh, requirement of the user. 
and the COD19 database here, uh, I have done the pre-processing. So this is a tokenization, normal, normalization, formatting at apply. And the BioBert NER model is constructed, which is a pre-trained model. And the entity recognition. So after giving the input, it is able to identify the entities in the text. And uh, these are the table presents evaluation metrics for the different named entities. It is able to identify, I have given some text, it is able to identify the tag indices. So the precision, you can see the precision recall and F1 stores and the accuracy. If you can see the accuracy as a 93.24 and the micro average as 83. Uh, you can see for every precision recall F1 score and support and the accuracy is 93.24. And uh, coming to the next one, the hardware requirements which I have used is I have used NVIDIA, NVIDIA as the GPU and uh, the software requirements are I just use the Python and uh, I have applied in the Jupyter Notebook. And uh, the RAM capability should uh, have the highest RAM capability. Otherwise, uh, we are unable to run the BioBert. And this is the sequence which I have used. The user is giving some data. And based on this, it is able to process the data. It is able to tokenize and normalize the data and uh, identify the named entities. And it is uh, giving back to the user. So which is very much useful to the researchers. And this is a sample text which I have given. Based on this, it is able to identify. You can see in this other term, addiction, and the two other essential, if you see the catalyst, this is a B chemical and role uh, as I, I chemical and protein as B gene or genome. This is how it is able to give the data. This is just a sample data which has been taken. And uh, based on this, the named entity evaluation matrix are given. So this is the table two, which is having some chemical substances. It is able to identify and give the accurate results. And uh, coming to the conclusion, which is very much useful for the researchers, for the coming biomedical, now we have constructed BERT and BioBert. We can construct in all the fields like a physics, chemistry, astrophysics, everywhere we can use this so that this will be much useful for the researchers uh, to do their research. Based on this uh, abstracts, we can easily segregate the abstracts also. This is uh, regarding my work. These are the references, some of the references I have used. If you have any questions, you can ask. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your presentation. Uh, now we can start with the Q&A, if there are any questions. Hello, yeah, I have a question over here. Yes, yeah, yeah. So since you have said that you use NER, and uh, if there is any uh, medicine name which coincides with a person name, so how would you identify that? How would you distinguish this is not a person name and this is a medical name or reverse? based on the correlation among the sentence if there is a correlation just like as i told you that apple is an organization apple is a fruit so whenever you use a bird based on the sentence or formation of the sentence based on the co-occurrence of the items and based on the correlation among the tokens we can easily identify whether it is a person or whether it is a chemical name. so have you taken such cases during the creation of gold standard yes yes sir we have done uh, in uh, because i have done my pdf in uh, bio uh, bioplastics, sir. At that time, we have done all these things, sir. Okay. So, if I want to add the number of fields, extra fields, so is it possible? So, later on, any stage, if I want to do it? Uh, we have to pre-train the model again, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Now, we will start with the next presenter. So, the next presenter we have here today is Andre Isaac Nazareth. Uh, and the paper he's presenting is Imaginate a Gen AI Approach Using Segmentation for Image Modification. Hello, I'll just share my screen. Yes. I hope that it's visible and that I'm clearly audible. So yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Isaac Nasrith. I'm the first author for my research paper, Imagine It, a Generative AI Approach Using Segmentation for Image Modification. So this is the agenda for today. Abstract introduction, problem statement, research gap, then system design methodology, image in painting method, the results, and the conclusion. So let's look at the abstract first. Generative AI, as we know, is an intersection of technology and creativity 
It is a process of creating original content, which can be in the form of images, videos, music, text, and much more. And uh, it has a lot of applications in the real world. We can see in social media, digital image uh, marketing, digital marketing, uh, social media, blockchain, etc. And we created by the use of generative models and in our particular use case, diffusion models. So the field we have chosen is interior designing, uh, which creates aesthetically pleasing images for the end user and makes their uh, jobs for interior designing artists easier or for an naive user to prefurbish the apartment, etc. So we use image segmentation and prompt engineering as a two main uh, methodological uh, processes. So this uh, proposed system eliminates the manual masking process of individual objects and it creates creative designs for the end user. Uh, this is achieved by using the segment anything model, SAM, along with uh, fine tuning the weights of the stable diffusion model, uh, which after the image is produced will be superimposed on the original image to create a uh, very creativistic and uh, appealing image. So uh, we have used the uh, fusion of cutting edge AI methodologies to create creative and transformative image ma manipulation. So as I've already said, uh, generative AI is the intersection of technology and creativity to create original content. In our use case, we have three important terms. Uh, the first part is segmentation, segmentation of various parts of an image, the various objects inside an image, uh, which in interior designing can be furniture, uh, such as sofas, lamps, etc. In the prompt engineering, the command which the user will give to the uh, to the system to change particular aspects of the image and the generative AI process behind it. So the problem statement is uh, for the domain of interior designing, uh, which will help naive users or interior designing artists. And uh, the current problem with uh, such systems is the lack of user guidance. The user is not able to correctly uh, give commands which can change particular segments of the image properly and context awareness for the generative AI model. So the desired state which we want to achieve is utilizing both visual cues from the images and the textual inputs from the prompts at the localized level. Uh, let's talk about the current research gap. Even though there have been a lot of advancements in generative AI and their application, there is still a uh, little bit of a research gap. So firstly, there's a limited integration in interior designing specifically. So there's also a manual uh, drawing for masking purposes of certain objects like sofas, lamps, cushions, etc. And there's a lack of comprehensive AI, which can comprehensively tell you why a system performed a particular way, which is also called as inference. Secondly, there's an insufficient use of advanced AI models. There's minimal applications of segmentation with diffusion models, which we have proposed in our uh, use case today. And thirdly, the gap in practical applications, there's a gap in uh, the uh, effectiveness of generative AI in real time designs. And also uh, there's a need for solution which creates high quality and user specific designs in the field of generative AI. So this is the system design. First, you take the input image. The input image is segmented where you derive various segments from the image, various objects in the image, and it'll generate a particular mask for it. We'll be seeing the generated mask in the later slides. Uh, then the user selects particular mask which they want to uh, modify, and using a prompt, the user can modify the segment. Then the modified segment is uh, then superimposed on the original image. So the image segmentation process is used uh, done by using SAM, which is segment anything model. SAM is a promptable segmentation with zero shot generalization. That means that we don't need to give it a pretext to what is to be done. It uh, already uh, understands the user's intentions by the use of transformers and attention seeking uh, mechanisms. So uh, segment anything model is uh, comprising of uh, 1 billion, uh, 11 million, varied high resolution images uh, and it also contains 1.1 billion high quality segmentation mass 
and the average mask per image is above 100. The masks are uh, created by using a particular uh, configuration which is Cocoa Run Length Encoding RLE Annotation Format, which you are seeing on the screen uh, just now in the below image. So it contains all the different uh, colored, uh, in colored objects, which are buildings in this case, uh, and they're separated by color. So this, let's uh, talk about the staple diffusion in painting model. So in this model, we uh, first take an image, which is uh, shown as X0 here. Then it is encoded and the various important features are removed from the image. And then we add noise to the image, which is the process of forward diffusion. Then we, uh, with the noise added to the image, we try to predict the noise. In stable diffusion happens by the use of UNet. And uh, UNet is given features, which are in the form of semantic match, text prompts, and images. So the image and the text prompt and the feature semantic match is added in this part of the stable diffusion model. And then the model tries to predict the noise and give a generative AI effect. So in this part, it tries to add in the, uh, the different uh, kind of variation to the image. And then uh, once you uh, remove the noise from the image, you'll get a new generative AI image. So uh, this is the first result case. Uh, as you can see on the top left, there's an unfurbished apartment. Uh, using uh, using the stable diffusion fine tuned model, we create a furbished apartment, and then uh, by the localization feature, we can also uh, change this uh, upper uh, portion to a creative fan or a chandelier. So uh, Sam is robust in its performance for the segmentation part, and also uh, it is accurately able to identify and isolate the object. In the second use case, again, there's an unfurbished apartment and uh, Stable Diffusion is able to uh, furbish the apartment with furnitures and uh, aesthetic vibe. And then we are selecting a mask, which is the ceiling, and we have selected certain portions of the curtains. And we are saying to give it a goldenish uh, brown carpet on the ceiling. And uh, it perfectly is able to do that for us. Then this is an edge case where we actually fail to uh, uh, perform segmentation properly. But this also has a very unique uh, edge case as well. So in this top right, left corner, we can see that uh, the unfurbished uh, room, uh, they have actually broken down the wall uh, and they have created a furbished apartment, which creates actually more space and uh, more uh, room for uh, a better, better aesthetic vibe. And in the part which we failed is the masking process. So in the masking process, it also took some parts of the yellow wall, which uh, it was not supposed to, uh, but it was able to change the style of the wall, not as we wanted to, but uh, this is an edge case. So in conclusion, I'd say that uh, Generate AI has revolutionized the field of interior designing. Uh, it has successfully integrated uh, advanced AI models such as uh, SAM and Stable Diffusion in our use case. And they have cre uh, we have created aesthetically pleasing customizable designs using the uh, without the reliance of manual designs and traditional methods. So uh, to conclude it, there's efficient image segmentation, there's creative and user-specific outputs, there's improved design process, and we have also got positive feedback from whoever has used our technology. Uh, we consulted uh, about five interior designing artists and also a couple of friends to try out our technology and they were very impressed by it. So in future work, uh, there is also generative AI is a vast field. Uh, there's a lot of uh, computation and work which are not currently available to us. So there's enhanced model training, which uh, the model can be trained on a more diverse training data set and more fine-tuning fine can be performed on the model. We trained on about uh, 12,000 epochs with uh, uh, smaller uh, uh, smaller batch size. So if somebody has more uh, uh, more resources at, at the availability, they can fine-tune it further. Uh, then we, it can also be integrated with other tools, design software, AR, VR, etc. 
and there can be also improvements to the user interface. So that's it from my side. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you, sir, for your presentation. Uh, now, if we have any questions. Uh, it was really a good presentation. I just have one question regarding the end of the presentation. Uh, you mentioned the age case where it is not working. So any reason which you have figured out why, what could be the reason of that and how will you try to overcome this? So, uh, as we can see that in this edge case, uh, the... Because, because to be honest, unless you mention it, you won't be able to see it's a failed case. But Correct. if, uh, what could be the reason and how to overcome that? Yeah. So, yeah. as we can see that uh, in the top right corner, uh, the furbished apartment, in this, the masking is not done properly. That's why the styling is not done. And the reason the, for that is the uh, difference in intensity. So one thing which we did not include in a model at the very start was the contrastive uh, process, which uh, is a pre-processing step. Actually, uh, after doing all this generator AI process, we realized we did not include a contrastive method to differentiate between the intensities. So you can see uh, this light color and the color of the ceiling, which is white, doesn't have a very varied intensity. So the masking is also taking this wall into the picture. So, uh, yeah, that was the reason uh, the this case failed. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Now we will start with our next presenter. Uh, so the next presenter of today's session is Abraham Shukla. Uh, I request you, sir, to please proceed with your presentation. And the paper title they're presenting is implementation of a web application for secure file lock upload and virus scanning. So my topic is uh, implementation of web application for secure file upload and virus scanning. So the main aim for our project was to build a platform which enables user to securely upload files and perform virus scanning using CLAM AV. So upon virus scanning, we will effectively protect our against the cyber threats by detecting and identifying the malicious content from those files, which safeguards ourselves from all types of files. Those files may be uh, PDFs, images, audios, any type of file. It also ensures the confidentiality and integrity and the availability of the information. So our main motivation was to protect ourselves from uh, various uh, viruses. For example, we all know that when a person, uh, when we get an email, that email may be attached with a PDF or uh, any image or audio file. And in that audio or a PDF, there may be a virus embedded in it. So we have to protect against those things. So cyber criminals seek to exploit the human or security vulnerabilities in order to steal passwords data or money directly or indirectly through enhancing their social engineering practice or advanced malware. So cyber threats today are increasing sophisticatedly and uh, the attackers are also employing AI and machine learnings to automate and enhance these malicious activities. So when the attacker gets the information of our computer, so they bad things can happen. So for example, when security measures are inadequate or ignored, they lead to data breaches or financial losses and damage to the organization's reputation. So this is our design uh, process design flowchart. Uh, yes, so this is our process design flowchart. Uh, the user can log into that Web, web app, web application. Uh, if it is use, use if it is a root user, then uh, it will display all the users, and uh, the root user can also enable and disable that particular account. If it is a normal user, it will directly go onto the dashboard, and uh, in that dashboard, the user can directly upload the file and then check for virus, and the status will come as whether it is infected or is it safe. So file upload and virus scanning. So it enables user to upload any type of file of any size. We upload those files on uh, the CLAM AV on the, in, into the Kafka sandbox and which is included with CLAM AV. We can use any kind of file. It may be PDF, image, audio, or video, etc. 
So the key consideration which we did was to include data encryption, secure transaction protocols, user authentication and access control. Access control because there is root user who can uh, access all those files and uh, all the users can be seen and uh, to build a robust malware detection mechanism. This is how the user uploads the file. We can see the icard.com and the image JPG file. If we click on the check status button, it will show us the file's detail and also it will detect what malware or virus the file has. For this, we have used Kaku Sandbox. Kaku Sandbox is an open source automated malware analysis. It is directly uh, uh, stored in the local, it is locally stored. It is not integrated with any uh, web app, uh, any website or uh, online because uh, if we have our own control in a, our own laptop or a, uh, on our own operating system, this will be much better. Kaku Sandbox also executes samples in a controlled environment and monitors their behavior to detect malware activity and ensures that the examination of potential threat. It also gives us the report of what the uh, file which has been done is given. So this is the working. First, we give them the file. In the Kaku Sandbox, we, the Kaku Sandbox is configured according to the operating system. It is built on the virtual machine. It can be a Windows virtual machine or an Ubuntu. It performs the analysis of the file and gives the report back whether it is a malware or safe file. So we have also used ClamAV, which is integrated with the Kaku Sandbox. The ClamAV is an open source antivirus software, which is used to detect and remove malware viruses and other malicious files. It is basically works how it checks the signatures and the take the signatures of the file. And if it matches to the signature of the virus, it detects as, as a malware file and then uh, isolates it. Yes, real-time virus detection, instantly, identi instantly identifying potential virus, threats to protect user data and systems. So when we click on check status, it shows that ICAR.com and ImageJPG file are there. The ImageJPG file is a safe file uh, while the icar.com file, which we have got, uh, consists of a virus known as win.test virus windows test icar hdb minus one. It also shows us the time and date when the virus has been concluded. So when we detect that uh, the malware is present in the, the particular file, we can in the Kaku sandbox it performs a deep analysis as, and uh, gives a comprehensive report about it. So based upon that report, it is it identifies at the severity of the threat. If it is high or medium, it uh, automatically quarantines that particular file and deletes upon the user's permission. Delete, deleted, deleting is important because uh, if the virus will be there in the host system, it will be very dangerous for the host system. Otherwise, the virus will be corrupted. Then uh, when the risk is low, the, the, the CLAM AV itself attempts to remove the virus or any other malicious header. This is a streamlined and automated process ensuring efficient malware remediation. So what are the benefits? So it keeps it safe and protects classified and sensitive information for being compromised. And uh, it has high volume threat management. This is uh, basically uh, uh, helps uh, rapid threat detection and remediation ensures minimal impact on the business operation. As soon as we get the data, we perform uh, the virus scanning, and uh, when the and when it has any virus in it, it detects it and uh, re removes it. Integrating the automated remediation process and large enterprises, government organization can significantly enhance their cybersecurity measures. So we have conducted uh, this uh, project on. Uh, 1,000 photos and 500 PDF, 700 videos and 1,500 audio files. We got this all uh, malicious uh, virus vi virus files from ICAR, Portiguard, virus total, hybrid analysis, and malware traffic analysis. When we tested these uh, demo demo files, we got our system to be accurate to 87.4 percent. This is our chart. This shows the photos, we PDF, videos, and audio files. There are no limitation of whatever file we upload and uh, the uh, what uh, file size it has. Thank you.
uh, thank you, sir. Uh, if there are questions. Okay, so the next presenter we have here today is Anushri Raj, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I request you to start with your presentation. The paper title she'll presenting will be on the influence of deep reinforcement learning techniques in vehicular networks. Is my screen visible? Yes. Fine. Uh, good morning to all. My paper today is here uh, to influence on deep reinforcement learning techniques in vehicular networks. So myself, uh, Dr. Anushri Raj and Pallavi, we are presenting this paper. So uh, coming into just a moment. Yeah. yeah, coming into the uh, abstract, actually, like the vehicle networks have become the prominent research in the topic because of their uh, uh, distinctive characteristics and uh, users, such as uh, consistencies, it could be effective traffic control, it could be or uh, road security, it could be and uh, uh, reinforcement, it could be. The network entitles uh, must make a judgment on how to exploit the network operations under the ambiguous uh, conditions. One of the challenging uh, operations under this ambient conditions is uh, to provide an expanding usage of the wireless technologies in a highly mobile environment. To improve uh, this uh, communication dependabilities in the environment, intelligent technologies uh, should have to be used actually to solve these routing issues and to construct more durable communication systems. So hence, uh, we have this reinforcement learning where we need to achieve this uh, reinforcement learning um, and uh, we can achieve this reinforcement learning. Uh, through this reinforcement learning, we can achieve these issues, which can effectively handle the challenges of these decisions making and so so hence, uh, also it is possible that reinforcement learning using with the deep reinforcement learning, a hybrid of reinforcement learning and deep learning that was been created to solve these issues. Uh, so we began this vehicular uh, network situations, which have uh, this vehicular networks, it has been actually in, uh, emerged as a critical research area due to their potentials and uh, revolutionized transportations in the daily life. So this networks generate the vast amounts of the uh, data requiring the advanced techniques to manage and analyze uh, uh, the data. Uh -huh. So here actually the very dynamic mobility settings, uh, which includes both slow moving autos and fast trains also. The data services with varying qualities of the services uh, and requirements for the durabilities, the latencies and the data rates uh, for the video games in cars and multimedia entertainment. Also, these things have been used. Uh, the delivery of the safety notifications with the extreme dependabilities and low latency of high predictions, map downloads, etc. have also been used here. The vehicle communications uh, device use an anticipated to expand this uh, rapidly despite to the spectrum becoming more fragment, fragmented and um, congested. So we can see in the diagram which has been given over here, uh, uh, it speaks about uh, the base stations which is present here and the cameras and the lidars which have been present. Um, so it speaks about the structure of this vehicular network which is given over here. Uh, the conventional communication tactics are not intended to handle such exclusive informations. Uh, hence, notable uh, reinforcement learning algorithms have been applied in this data in order to address uh, foremost mentioned problems. Uh, this, uh, these are the different problems which I mentioned in earlier. So 6G intent is also used to connect the every small gadget of this internet. We're using that uh, 6G networks with all these vehiculars which are been present. So we'll be um, uh, able to track the locations of the uh, vehicular networks which are been moving across. Uh, as I told, reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning have been um, uh, combined together, showed as a hybrid, uh, uh, hybrid uh, algorithms which we have developed over here for the challenging which are posing with this vehicular, vehicular networks which are been used. So these methods, actually, these hybrid methods are being used to enable the vehicles to take an intelligent decisions in dynamic environments to optimize the various aspects such as to slow to flow the traffic flow, it could be for the security, it could be and for the resource allocations, it could be. So this paper, uh, it actually speaks about the taxonomy of the re reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning applications which are used in vehicular networks. Uh, which highlights the potentials to improve the vehicular resource management and transportation information network. A, flow, a, ta a, a taxonomy of the reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning applications which are used in vehicular networks is, shows, is shown in the diagram which is shown here. 
uh, but still the key challenges uh, which are been uh, observed here and for the future directions are uh, like for the research which include the handling and the complexities of the vehicular network for ensuring the data privacy and security developing the robust and efficiency uh, effectively we use this uh, uh, networks a broad range of itc applications and uh, facilities will be made flexible by vehicular networks which improve the entertain uh, entertainment traffic productivities and enabling the autonomous driving in order to provide these services so we to x communications we have used which make the use of variety of wireless communication technologies um uh, the use of cars for this vehicular networks and the vehicular communication challenge channels are initially categorized uh, into sections like uh, dsrcs and um, cv2x and then we introduce this uh, later according to uh, according to the algorithm which is required for us the existing system which are been used for this vehicular networks are this gps based vehicle locations we have multi hoppings and uh, vanet we have and congestions um congestions reductions is there heterogeneous vanet is there v2v and uh, v2rsu is there machine learnings in vehicular networks we are been using machine learning advancements in 6g vehicular networks also has been used and green uav communications is used um they primarily focus on the traditional techniques and gap was uh, i mean the the things were not worked on with reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning so that is where we have take up took up this reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning to work on this vehicular network so this is actually the structure of the vehicular network the proposed system which is given um the vehicular networks and their potentials are been used to enhance the transportation systems through v2x communications uh, so as uh, the ped pedestrians are been moving you can see in the diagram which has been shown here as the pedestrians are moving so uh, we get this uh, uh, what alerting systems for the systems and uh, it is a cellular based v2x technologies we are been using the evolutions of this uh, cellular uh, vehicle networks for For LTE and V2X, using 5G and uh, NR V2X is outlined, highlights uh, which highlights the need of the future enhancements beyond this 5G and uh, 6G technologies. What is present as of now, the technologies such as uh, D2D, NOMA, and uh, UDN, MIMO, and uh, cognitive radios are identified as the crucials for achieving the goal and for the future vehicular networks we have been used. Uh, actually, the te essential technologies in the cellular networks so is by providing a direct device contact without using any network. This D to D it paves the solutions for this uh, cellular networks network capacities problem. And uh, NOMA that is NOMA enhances the spectrum efficiency, which allows the several users to share a single frequency resources. A very high user uh, densities can be used in managing this UD UDN while network capacities has been increased. MIMO, which I mentioned, it aids in increasing diversities, which gains the support to the greatest number of users. This massive MIMO helps to provide very high network connectivity. Uh, so, conjunctions uh, cognitive radio modifies the several parameters for the simultaneous transmissions to achieve the lofty of uh, 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 what is this? The objectives which are being used, objectives which are present to beyond this 5G and 6G. A range of disruptive technologies will need to incorporate, such as uh, more dependabilities and effect. to where parts it could be resource sharing decision make up and uh, processing will be used in reinforcement learning uh, uh, we have used uh, uh, here it is a machine learning techniques which uh, where the agents learn to make the decisions by interacting with the environment it's an automated uh, system a macro decision process uh, mdb which is present for this mathematical framework for the re reinforcement learning problems which have been addressed here and the deep in uh, reinforcement learning which combines uh, with the reinforcement learning with deep learning uh, to enhance to make uh, decision making capability is by learning from more experiences a vehicular resource management system which explores uh, deep reinforcement for the resource uh, there might be some network issues uh, i think we should proceed to the next presenter sure so the next presenter is dhanush si uh, and the paper title uh, he is presenting on is iot based safe and smart automations of agriculture lands good morning i am dhanush my project is iot based safe and smart automations of agriculture lands so the project population of india being 1500 million by 
2050 and agriculture remaining as the primary source of livelihood in rural areas should be on the increase of productivity solar power is being increasingly utilized worldwide as a renewable source of energy in such situation automation play an important role to maintain water level without human interaction coming to introduction supply or complete breakdown for hours together has almost become routine today power problem to farmers for irrigation is a regular problem so we have introduced here solar power solar power is being increasingly utilized worldwide as a renewable source of energy it has huge untapped solar off grid opportunities so the project overview objective and goals the project proposes a solar based automatic irrigation system the main objective is to design a low cost and time based irrigation system with the help of Arduino and monitoring the security of the field by monitoring animal presence irrigation scheduler measures various parameters such as humidity temperature and soil moisture this automatic irrigation system uses alternative energy that drives water pump to water from bore well to a tank and therefore the outlet valve of tank is automatically regulated exploration controller in this irrigation system the irrigation pump controlled in two modes automatic mode and wifi wi mode methodology check solar energy whether it's available or not using ldr if available track the panel to maximum power point using motor when solar energy is not available check for three phase power intimate farmer when power comes through wifi module check dry run of motor and turn off when motor is running dry i'll show a demo video here with the project work sir technology uses this iot sensor conclusions in our project we have designed a model to help the farmers in rural zones our remote controller could be installed on existing pump sets for a nominal cost operating our remote controller does not require any special skills implementation wireless sensor networks thank you um, thank you uh are there any questions okay i'll start with the next presenter uh so the next presenter is prathamish vijay lahande sir and the paper title they are presenting on is novel hybrid machine learning algorithms for resource optimization in cloud sir uh, you may start with your presentation yes sure i hope that i am audible and uh, yes sir you are also, and i am also sharing my presentation i hope my presentation is also visible yes yes thank you thank you for giving me this chance to talk to you all of you and uh, let me start with my presentation titled novel hybrid machine learning algorithm for resource optimization in cloud computing so this is what uh, we have contributed and it has been presented by me dr prathamesh dr parag and dr 
Saini who are uh, from SICSR, Symbiosis, Pune. So let me start with cloud terminologies and introduction. So our research revolves around firstly cloud computing, cloud being used in every everything today. So cloud is the next big thing and everything is cloud based today. Second is load balancing. So whatever request we have at our user end, they will be submitted to the cloud for computing. And then the cloud has to ensure proper load balancing has been done. And that's what is the second uh, domain in field of our study. And third one is reinforcement learning. So these are the three prominent areas of our research domain, cloud computing, load balancing, and reinforcement learning. And we have contributed our own algorithm called reinforcement learning, first come first serve, and reinforcement learning, shortest job first so that the load balancing can be enhanced. And in this paper, we have compared the performance of RLFCFS and RLSJF. So these are the objectives of our study. So we have designed to design and implement hybrid load balancing algorithms, which I just mentioned. So the current FCFS algorithm is hybridized with reinforcement learning to make RLFCFS and shortest job first has been hybridized to make reinforcement learning. And this paper talks about comparison of their performance. And uh, in this particular thing to compare the performance, we have conducted an experiment in an open source simulated environment by implementing RLFCFS and RLSJF load balancing algorithms. And to compare their performance, we have used load balancing performance parameters, load managed and deviation percentage from ideal load balance. And we have also given quite good mathematical equations and also uh, we have done the comparison. And not only that, we have analyzed the experimental results and validated them using regression models. So this is the literature review that helped us uh, to make sure that we are finding out the gaps and no one uh, till today has uh, combined reinforcement learning with uh, these heuristic algorithms. Yes, we can see some uh, machine learning algorithms been improvised but uh, not with uh, load balancing. So this is what the literature really helped us to find out the gap. And now let us come to the main part about the experimental design. So the simulator that we have used is workflow sim, which is an open source. Everyone in the cloud, everyone knows about workflow sim. It's quite a, a renowned uh, simulator free of cost. Algorithms RLFCFS and RLSJ we have incorporated into workflow sim and we have taken, taken real time data that is Alibaba task event data set of 80,000 odd tasks for uh, making sure that the comparison is done for load balancing. And we have done this experiment in two phases. Obviously, first phase will be with RLFCFS and second phase will, will be with uh, RLSJF and to ensure that these uh, the, the algorithms are having a uh, an unbiased comparison, we have used 10 stages in each experimental stage where the virtual machine configuration uh, ranges from 5, 10, 15 and so on till 50 and that's what the 10 stages is all about and performance parameters like I mentioned is average load balanced and average deviation percentage and this is the architecture of the experiment where we have used reinforcement learning to improvise and improve the current load balancing algorithms. So you can see there are user requests which are submitted on, on the internet. And then when they reach the cloud computing environment, we are going to use the reinforcement learning mechanism along with FCFS and shortage job first. And along with a good uh, queue table, they will be computed. So this is what is the architecture of uh, the experiment. And these are the results. Uh, we have uh, presented the results in, five, in 10 different scenarios. You can see the leftmost is virtual machines ranging from 5, 10, 15, and so on until 50. And the first one is average load managed. And the second one is average deviation percentage. This is what the results are for every phase. And uh, these are the results. And uh, these results, uh, let me come back to this slide again. These results show us that the performance of them are compared with expected load and expected deviation percentage. Uh, these results are also analyzed using linear regression model where we have calculated uh, the equations the y-intercept and the r-square value, which really helps us to understand whether the performance is really varied at using a mathematical model. 
very seldom it happens that we have we are presenting results but not proving them mathematically but you can see that we have done an extra bit by uh, by analyzing the results also using mathematical model and let me now talk about the findings so the findings show us the findings show us that uh, the aggregate load managed by fcfs is 968 and that of RLSJF is 999. So concerning the deviation percentage that how much deviation by ideal load. So RLF FCF is deviated by 63% uh, and then RLSJF deviated by 64%. So there's a very uh, a low contention in between them and then we can see that these results are helping us to understand that FCFS, RLFCFS gave better resource optimization because we can see that it is deviating less and it is also managing less number of load and now rather than just using the current FCFS or SJF we can try to use RLFCFS or RLSJF and in that also we can have the answer that we can go for RLFCFS for this particular better performance and uh, these are the references which helped us with the literature review with the gaps uh, with the entire study. So thank you so much uh, to the entire conference team for giving me this opportunity and uh, any questions, they are all most welcome. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Uh, are thank there any much. questions? How precisely you have used reinforcement learning and this what parameters were considered for creating yes, an objective function? Yes. We have considered all the reinforcement learning parameters. We have used a Q table also. We have used the learning factor. We have used a discount rate. Uh, we have used action states, everything that we have considered because uh, a task that has to be executed using reinforcement learning, it has to go through all the actions, all the states. For example, the task is being executed the task is finished execution. All these were the uh, states and actions will be submitting to the virtual machines, submission or any error. So all these factors we have 100% considered for, uh, for our algorithm. Okay, sir. Nice one. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, so the very last presenter we have here with us is uh, Riddhi Kasar, ma'am. And the paper title she's presenting is Plant Maps, Environmental Conservation Using Gamification. Ma'am, I request you to start with your presentation. Uh, so I think she is not present with us. Uh, so we'll have to proceed to the closing ceremony. Uh, so it was a great session. Uh, I sincerely thank our authors for their excellent presentations and contribution in this session and all our participants for being a part of this international conference. I hope this session was informative enough. We, on the behalf of the whole team, thank you for the support during the ninth version and all previous eight versions of the conference. We will be happy to have you in the 10th version in 2025. All the presenters would be getting the digital certificates through email within two working days. Further, all the papers have already been forwarded to the Springer. The publication will be live within six months kindly cooperate with the team of ICT 4SD 2024. And lastly, I also want to thank our session chair, Dr. Abhijit Chitri for chairing this session. A token of appreciation to the chair on the behalf of our team and Global Knowledge Research Foundation and partners. Thank you for your valuable presence.